I think I have access. Okay, great. All right, guys, we thank all of you for joining us as they prepare to pull up their presentation. Uh, we will uh, proceed when they are ready. I think that these are some excellent papers, particularly at a time where African-American women uh, have uh, taken over our political system and are, and are really asserting themselves in terms of the types of representation, in terms of policy pursuits, and a number of different uh, areas as it relates to politics. As we know from a lot of the academic scholarship is that African-American women bring a unique perspective to deliberative bodies and legislative chambers. And as a result, they represent a distinct interest. And I think that these papers today will inherently deal with the ways in which black women represent certain political issues and the perspectives that they bring to legislative chambers. And so at this time, we'll turn it over to our first uh, group of presenters. Well, hello everyone. It's good to see everybody. Thank you for coming to our uh, talk presentation of our paper, Talking and Testifying, Black Congresswoman's Response to COVID-19. I am Jasmine Jackson, and I have my co one of my co-authors here with me today, Michael Strawbridge. Dr. Nadia Brown could not be here today, but she sends well wishes, and I'm pretty sure she misses everyone. And before I get started, I would also like to acknowledge the uh, work of Millie Ja, our award-winning undergraduate research assistant. Uh, we couldn't have done this without Millie, so we want to always make sure that we, we give her her credit where credit is due. So before we get started, just a little bit of background on how this project came to be. Uh, around this time last year, we were all together, those of us who did come to NCOPES, and as we were at the, uh, at the conference, everyone's getting emails about travel restrictions and all these different things. And by the time I know I got home, the world was shut down. <laughs> so at the beginning of the pandemic, everyone is constantly glued to the screens. We're constantly watching the news. And for political scientists, this is nothing new because we do this for our research anyway. So the three of us began to have conversations about how elected officials were handling the pandemic. And as the pandemic continued, we saw that several instances of racial injustice continued to happen. And we began to notice differences in how members of Congress chose to advocate for their respective communities. And of course, then we began to brainstorm on how we could research this topic. And this is the fruits of our labor, well, at least the first version of the fruits of our labor. And so we're gonna jump right into it. So first we have to contextualize where the uh, coronavirus pandemic falls within global history. And the pandemic corresponds to a point where democracy is on the decline. More countries have begun to lose rather than gain civil and political rights. And because of this, authoritarianism is rapidly expanding and autocratic regimes are instituting more stringent policies so that they can restrict individuals from moving around and spreading the virus. Government's responses to the coronavirus pandemic have amplified inequalities, yet while showing that these same inequalities are inconsequential in emergency govern uh, governance. Black communities, along with other minority, uh, marginalized and minority groups and stigmatized social groups are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And according to the COVID race, racial data tracker, Black or African-American deaths make up 98 of every 100,000 COVID-related deaths in the United States. And this is compared, uh, this is, this is, is 2.3 times the rate for white people in the US. And as the minority party in government, members of the Congressional Black Caucus, also known as the CBC, often use rhetorical strategies to shape the political agenda. During the pandemic, uh, the disparate impact that COVID-19 is having on black communities is of course a primary interest to the CBC. And members of the CBC recognize that, uh, that racism is a, is a systemic failure of the American democratic system. And as we can see in the quote by Representative Barbara Lee, she states that we have a pandemic upon a pandemic in the African-American community. And this is to show that the coronavirus is only one of the ills that black Americans are facing. And as representative of black communities, do all of the CBC members rhetorically challenge the government's role in contributing to racialized inequality during the pandemic? 
And in this paper, we try to assess how Black caucus members uh, discuss race and the coronavirus. So our research question is, do women members of the Congressional Black Caucus use their platform to warn of anti-democratic modes such as racism causing Blacks to have an unparalleled rise to the COVID-19 sick sickness and deaths as compared to their Black male counterparts of the CDC? And before we got into our research, we had to first turn to the literature regarding how race and gender affect political communication. And Brown and Gershon found that members of Congress use their time during, hearing, uh, during hearings and floor debates to communicate to, vo uh, to voters. However, there are gendered and racialized differences in what issues members of Congress choose to emphasize. Women members of Congress are more likely to, uh, to communicate women's issues more than their male counterparts, while Black members of Congress are more likely to emphasize racial issues. When we look into the differences in what Black lawmakers choose to communicate, we find that Black women lawmakers have different policy positions than Black men. These women are more likely to emphasize education, health care, economic development, and employment as their key policy issues. And Ori finds that Black men are, are more likely to support racialized issues uh, than gender issues. And Black members of Congress even differ in what platforms they use to communicate these racialized issues, with Black women more likely to use Twitter um, to discuss racialized issues such as Black Lives Matter more than Black men. And because we focus on the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, here's just a little brief background about the caucus. The caucus was formed in 1971 after the Voting Rights Act, which allowed for a significant amount of Black politicians to be elected into Congress. And the CBC provides both uh, substantive and descriptive representation for the Black community. And the literature shows that while whites can represent Black constituents, um, Tate found that members of the CBC are more likely to break away from the Democratic Party and, adv and like further advocate for the Black community, which allows for them to have a unique race-based representation. And since uh, the 93rd Congress, the CBC has grown by over 300% with members filling important positions such as Minority Whip in the House and Chairman of the House Democratic Caucus. And so I'm going to turn it over to MJ. So I'm going to mute myself. And he will pick up right here. We send our analysis around uh, House uh, committee hearings. And we chose this mainly because the C-SPAN video library contains over 260,000 hours of video coverage of all congressional hearings, along with transcripts we made it easy for data collection. And we wanted to focus on House hearings specifically because this is as a space where the rhetoric is likely more partisan and strategic given the environment. So we wanted to observe how members in their allotted amount of time, which is usually around five minutes in a hearing, chose to prioritize or not prioritize discussing the disparate effects of COVID-19 for minority groups and other vulnerable populations. Uh, we use the available indexes within the search to filter our search to only those hearings that are related to coronavirus disease 2019, which produced 97 hearings. Uh, and we used every individual mark from those hearings as its own unit of analysis. And this gave us 1,905 individual speaking segments which coders then, uh, individual coders used for quantitative and qualitative content analysis. On the, con on the quantitative side, you see, uh, we start with if the segment was a uh, procedural statement. So if it was a mark such as I yield, thank you, yes, no, no substantive statement, analysis ended there. However, then from there, we move into our three dependent variables. The first being general disparities. If it mentioned disparity affecting any vulnerable population. Then we, we denote the remarks that discuss a racial disparity. Then third, we denote remarks that address specifically a black racial disparity. We use binomial regressions for our analysis and we followed the approach of Taylor 2019, who we said earlier, used a similar analysis of Twitter data to observe the effects and include important control variables like margin of victory uh, and Southern districts and, and other important uh, factors. On the qualitative side, we then use thematic analysis to identify important themes throughout the, uh, the conversation. So our mixed method design allowed us to observe not just the frequency, but also how members discuss disparities. Uh, 
As you can see first on figure one, this is the breakdown of just the categories of topics discussed by members, including government response and oversight, racial injustice, housing and economics, education, and health and available resources. And then you see that members did in fact discuss, uh, they did include disparity rhetoric throughout their conversations in house hearings. Uh, nearly over 400 remarks addressed disparities in some form or fashion, over 200 addressed racial disparities, and over half of those racial disparity comments specifically addressed Black racial disparities, which isn't surprising given that they are the Congressional Black Caucus. So this allowed us to, to uh, find our first conclusion that the CBC does in fact address disparities and racial disparities and those specifically addressing the Black community. But we want to go a step further and see for any differences between Black men and women within the CBC. Our regression analysis didn't produce any statistical significance, and we partially credit that to the simple fact that our data was not that large. For context, uh, Taylor 2019, when they, they did their analysis of Twitter, they had over 20,000 tweets. In our analysis, we had just under 2,000 individual statements. So the variance necessary to produce the kind of results we were looking for just wasn't there yet. But when we transform the results into incident rates for just better interpretation, you can see some important differences in their coefficients. When you're looking at the female coefficient, you see that when it comes to discussing all disparities, women were just were slightly more likely to discuss them. But then you look at racial disparities and women were actually less likely to discuss them. But then somehow they were then once again more likely to discuss black racial disparities. And while that might seem counterintuitive, what it's really showing us is, is the fact that while all members discuss disparities, when it comes to racial disparities, black men, they are more likely to discuss disparities as a whole but they stop there and black women are then those going the extra mile to then specifically address the disparities and experiences in the black community. And you see then here, we look even further at the individual differences among members of who was even willing to discuss disparities in their hearings at all. Every black woman in the CDC discussed disparities facing some vulnerable population, while four black men didn't. When it comes to racial disparities, again, only three black women did not discuss disparities, or eight black men did not discuss racial disparities. And lastly, you see that over double the number of black men didn't discuss black racial disparities compared to women. So not only do we see that black women were going the extra mile to discuss COVID-19 and how it's affecting the black community specifically, it was also the fact that they were, more, they were on, a, uh, on a grander scale doing it as a collective, while only a subset of black men were doing so. But to further examine differences between the black men and women that we couldn't find in our quantitative analysis, we turn to the qualitative side. So our qualitative analysis allows for us to see nuanced differences in the rhetoric used by CBC members. Um, with black women, like we said, being more likely to discuss any disparities, whether it be the general disparities, racial disparities, and uh, disparities that specifically affect the black community. So here we have a quote from uh, Representative Laura Underwood, and she states that we know during times of disaster, whether healthcare disasters uh, and emergencies, economic disasters and emergencies, it is vulnerable populations to see disparities get exacerbated. So here she's speaking about general disparities overall. And so as we go into one of the four themes of the qualitative analysis, and those four themes are underserved populations, uh, health, the economy, and the targeted disparity on black women. So here we have a quote by Maxine Waters discussing racial disparities and how black and brown communities may be left out of di uh, digital contact tracing efforts. So here we see her not only just say like this is something that affects the general population, but she takes the extra step to go, hey, no, we see that based on history, black and brown people are more likely to be left out. But this very important thing regarding the pandemic. And here we see, uh, we have a quote by Representative Robert, uh, Robin Kelly, and she here is stating, stating that minority patients have uh, worse health outcomes than white patients. And so she is then now talking about the, uh, the racial disparities that occur in our healthcare systems. And she's asking once again, how we can overcome this. And we see that this is something that, uh, that Black women lawmakers feel very passionate about. Now, regarding economics, we have a quote from uh, represent, uh, Representative William Lacey Clay. And here he is talking about racial disparities. So he does not just leave it at general disparities. However, we see that he does not take the step 
to say, hey, this is something that directly affects the black community. And we see here that he says that, you know, the racial and the, uh, the racial and the gender wealth gap prevents women and minority entrepreneurs from starting a new business. So here, it also may have been an opportunity for him to even take it a step further and talk about how this uh, specifically affected the black community, but he did not. And lastly, we have a quote by Ayanna P uh, Presley, and she is very specific in letting you know who she's talking about when she is talking about this disparity or this burden. And she says flat out that, hey, we know that black renters and black women in particular who are renters, they are more likely to be evicted and that this affects their credit. And so she's very specific about how she chooses to discuss this disparity. So there is no question as to who she's talking to. So once again, we see that black women are able to be more specific in their rhetoric uh, to advocate for their, com uh, their communities. So when it comes to our main takeaways from our analysis, the main thing we know is the CBC as a collective are representing the black community rhetorically uh, and in the congressional chambers. But we also see there's important gendered fragmentation that needs to be explored further in the difference between the black men and black women in the CBC. Black women seemingly are going the extra mile and specifically addressing the black racial disparities while black men are more likely to speak in a broader sense. And secondly, black women when it comes to discussing these issues, they're the ones who they just, they talk about them differently. Um, from, a, from a method standpoint, our research uh, depicts the importance of quantitative and qualitative research because where our quantitative research failed to provide the necessary differences we were looking for, our qualitative did. So both are very important in doing this kind of research. And we plan to continue this research uh, moving forward uh, what we presented today on the congressional meetings, this is currently being uh, prepared for a uh, edited volume, while a larger analysis of Twitter data of a similar form, even more similar to uh, Taylor 2019's research is, uh, is in the works right now. So far, we've scraped over 10,000 tweets since January 3rd, analyzing the 1 to 17th Congress, uh, and we're looking to do similar analysis. But on that end, we're currently in the roadblock of figuring out the best way to parse out COVID-19 related uh, tweet specifically in the same way we're able to sort of uh, sort out and filter for just congressional hearings on COVID-19. Because as the pandemic has been going on for over a year now, the topic of COVID-19 has become just so diverse that you don't have to say COVID-19, but you're going to be talking about economics or education and other important issues all related to the pandemic. But when it comes to filtering our results to get to the, that kind of discussion, to see how gender differences exist in discussing disparities related to COVID, that's what we're currently trying to figure out the best approach. But for now, uh, those are our results, and we plan to continue our research examining the gendered fragmentation in the Congressional Black Caucus. Thank you. All right, thank you all for your presentation. Let's give them a hand. These are our graduate students. I remember it seems like the other day I was a graduate student presenting on uh, nervous. So keep up this great work that bears testament to the uh, spirit of what we at INCOPES do, and that is produce research that interrogates critically the role of race and representation. So continue to make strides doing that. Uh, at this time, we'll turn to our next presenter, our next presenter, um, and our next paper, uh, our next presenter's paper is entitled, let me pull up my notes here, I have about a hundred different tabs open. Um, All right, the next uh, paper is entitled uh, Reclaiming um, My Time. Hold on one moment, let me pull this up here. All right, uh, Mr. Dorsey, you are ready. And the title of your paper is, I have, excuse me, I'm just having a terrible time. Reclaiming My Time, The Rise of Black Congress Congresswomen as Committee Chairmen. At this time, let's turn our attention to this presentation. So you have about 12 minutes, 12 to 15 minutes. Thank you, thank you. Can you all see this? Uh, I can't see the screen, I see you. You're trying to share your presentation? Yep. Um, so let's see. No, we can't see your screen yet. Um, try sharing it again and see what happens. There we go. Is it is it okay? Here we go. Yeah, here it is, right here. Let's 
So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Cody Dorsey. I am so excited to be with you all today. I am a master's graduate, 2020 master's graduate from University College Dublin in Ireland. Uh, because and the exam explicitly tells you to use math, you know, everywhere. And like the only... I hear someone. Let's see. All right. So again, I'm Cody Dorsey. I am a 2020 graduate of the University of College Dublin with an MA in political science. And I am currently a, a doctoral student at Morgan State University. This is my first conference. I'm glad to be with you all. I'm a little sad that it is not in person in my hometown of Baltimore, but I am glad to join you all virtually. So my title of my uh, paper was, as part of my master's thesis, is Reclaiming My Time, The Rise of Black Congresswomen as Committee Chairs. And, uh, you know, I graduated from an Irish university and while a lot of my peers were focused on um, Brexit and European integration, I chose and was the only person to choose an American topic to look at Black Congresswomen. And uh, I wanted to look at their committee assignments. I wanted to look at how long it took them to become chair of a committee. And one of the good things about presenting was uh, presenting and writing this paper as I got to work with some pretty outstanding legends in Congress, including the first Black Congresswoman to chair a committee Congressional Committee, uh, Congresswoman Yvonne Burke, who gave a great review. I'm very happy about it. So an overview, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my inspiration, talk about the five Black Congresswomen to serve as committee chairs, talk about the factors to securing a committee chairmanship, make the case for seniority, some findings, and then my conclusion. So of course, that 2017 famous hearing before the House Financial Services Committee where Congresswoman Maxine Waters reclaimed her time from Treasury Secretary, then Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, was some inspiration. But it goes a little further than that with Congresswoman uh, Chisholm, who, when she took her seat in Congress in 1969, was assigned to the House Agriculture Committee. And she went to the leadership and she said, I am a Congresswoman from New York. Why am I on the Agriculture Committee? And the Speaker of the House told her, you have to be a good soldier and you will eventually move to a committee that you're interested in. And so she went to the Democratic Caucus and she said, I am the first black Congresswoman in this country and this is not my background. And so she eventually moved to, uh, was reassigned to the House Veterans Affairs Committee and she remarked with great candor, well, I have more veterans in my district than I have trees, so I will gladly accept that committee assignment. She eventually got on her prized committee, which was um, the House Education and Labor Committee. And then from there went to the Rules Committee upon her retirement. So I wanted to see after learning about Congresswoman uh, Chisholm's tenure in Congress, how long it takes a Congresswoman to become a chair. And if white Congresswomen, their white counterparts are more likely to become a chair before they do. So these are the five black Congresswomen, the chair committees, Congresswoman Burke, House Beauty Shop Committee, Congresswoman Belinda McDonald, House, Administra uh, House Administration Committee, Stephanie Tubbs Jones, House Ethics Committee, Congresswoman Waters and Congresswoman Johnson currently serves as chair of committees, um, House Financial Services and House Science Committee respectively. It's worth mentioning here that Congresswoman Melinda McDonald and Congresswoman Tubbs Jones only sh served short times as committee chairs. Congresswoman McDonald uh, passed away after a couple months as a committee chair and Congresswoman Tubbs Jones passed away after a year as a committee chair. So the factors in reaching a chairmanship, you have to think about committee transfers, you have to think about committee politics and seniority. With committee transfers, a lot of black Congresswomen just like Congresswoman Chisholm don't get their first committee when they are assigned, uh, when they take their seat in Congress. And so Congresswoman Moore, who's pictured on the left side of the screen here, she was uh, originally assigned to the House Financial Services Committee, moved to budget, and then in 2019 was on the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, that's where she sits now. I can say that it is very unlikely that Congresswoman Moore, after serving 16 years in Congress, will become um, chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, which is an exclusive prize committee. Committee assignment politics, on the other hand, using your political influence to get the committee that you want. In her first term in Congress, Congresswoman 
Burke, who is in the center of the screen, was assigned to Appropriations Committee, which is a prize committee. It's an exclusive committee. She um, was from California and has served as the DNC vice chair. And a lot of people in her delegation supported her to become Appropriations Committee uh, chair. It's also to be mentioned that she served on select committees to investigate the assassinations of JFK and MLK. Uh, and so she was very well liked in her state and in Congress. Then the most typical way to become a chair is seniority. Congresswoman Maxine Waters had seniority uh, and you just bid your time. And then once you're there long enough, you can reclaim your time. So the case for seniority, I'll, I'll first say that the seniority system has been described as a straitjack. Uh, many people who are junior lawmakers are very unhappy with the seniority system because it takes them so long to get somewhere. The Congressional Black Caucus, of course, which celebrates its 50th anniversary this year, typically supports seniority because it allows its members to become committee chairs without regard to race. Uh, seniority rewards the senior member who should be well versed in the committee's business. Congressman Cummings is an exception to the rule with seniority when he became the chair of the House Oversight Committee. Congressman Cummings was not the most uh, uh, senior member of that committee. Uh, and then this year we saw someone uh, become the first chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Congressman Greg Meeks from New York, because of seniority. And he's the first black chair of that committee. And most times black politicians are not seen as being well versed in foreign affairs or having an interest in foreign affairs. And uh, fortunately for Congressman Meeks, he had seniority and was able to become chair of that committee. So getting to my findings, I look at the 102nd Congress and the 103rd Congress, and that allows enough time for a Congresswoman to have seniority. And then we can still look at the Congresswomen who are in Congress today. So in the 102nd Congress, uh, there were five women elected in their first term to serve. Uh, and these are the five here on the screen. And only one of them at the time, the conclusion of this writing of this thesis be, was a chair of a committee, Congressman Waters. So she shows that it takes um, a long time for a black Congresswoman to become a committee, but it would show if you're looking at this Congress that a black woman became chair of a committee before a white woman. What we know now is that Congresswoman Delero is now a chair of a committee, chair of appropriations committee, but at the time of this writing, she had not been. We see that Congresswoman Horn only served one year, not enough time to gain seniority. Congresswoman uh, Collins, six years, not a, not a whole lot of time to gain seniority. And Congresswoman Clayton, 11 years, uh, and did not have uh, committee assignments in her first year as she was elected in a special election. And then in the 103rd Congress, uh, four times the amount of women were elected than in the previous Congress. And what we see is that, again, Congressman Johnson, a, a black woman became chair of a committee before a white woman, um, Congresswoman Maloney, who became chair of oversight committee after the uh, passing of Congressman Cummings. And Congresswoman Maloney, is the most senior member of the oversight committee showing that seniority and the seniority system dominates committee assignments and, uh, committee assignments and uh, transitioning into the role of chair. Uh, it's worth mentioning that Congresswoman Velasquez became a committee chair before a black Congresswoman or a white Congresswoman and she is Hispanic. And I have these two women here at the bottom, Blanche Lincoln and Senator Maria Cantwell because they were elected in the same Congress. And one of the things that white women are able to do and white politicians are able to do is to make the transition to higher office and statewide office. Uh, Senators Cantwell and former Senator Lincoln made the transition to the US Senate where they became committee chairs in the Senate. So this is a table of uh, women who were elected in the succeeding Congresses uh, of the, from the 102nd and the 103rd Congress. Uh, They're all white women. You'll see that most of them uh, are Republicans. 
And they became committee chairs before these black women and at a quicker rate. You see, it took Congresswoman uh, Blacks just six years, Congresswoman Brooks four years. And that's partly because on the Republican side, the Republican conference, they term limit uh, chairmanships in Congress. And there's a rotation of committee chairmanships uh, and you have opportunity to become a committee chairman uh, quicker, but you also have the opportunity to become a committee chair of uh, more than one committee if you stay in Congress long enough. So in my conclusion, this is what I've learned, what we've learned. Black Congresswomen's tenures as committee chairs are typically short, much shorter than white Congresswomen. White Congresswomen become committee chairs at a faster rate than their Black counterparts. Black Congresswomen typically become committee chairs of less prized committees. Uh, that's just the reality. We've not seen a Black Congresswoman become a chair of House Ways and Means or House Appropriations Committee, which are exclusive committees. Uh, financial Services is now an exclusive committee, but it was not always uh, an exclusive committee where you only serve on that one committee. Black Congresswomen are more likely to become a committee chair if they come from a larger delegation. So what we saw uh, of three out of the five Congresswomen who be, Black Congresswomen who became committee chairs, they all came from California, which has a larger delegation and uh, represent a nice portion of the Democratic caucus. Black Congresswomen are more likely to gain seniority if they're serving a majority minority district. You, if you're in a swing district, you're less likely to win re-election, therefore um, jeopardizing your seniority. And the traditional seniority system is color and gender blind. If you go off seniority and you have served the most time, you will become a committee chair. But of course, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, that is not, those are, that is not the only factor uh, in deciding uh, who becomes a committee chair. And I have some recommendations for some black congresswomen uh, if they, that I think would uh, increase the likelihood of them becoming a uh, committee chair, of course, is use political influence to get more prize committees. You wanna raise some money for the political party and become chummy with your colleagues. I was interviewing uh, Congressman Clyburn uh, from South Carolina and he said to me, Cody, nothing beats substance uh, when you are serving in Congress. And so that's an important factor. You have to ensure that you have a good relationship with colleagues. Do not transfer committees beyond the freshman year. Uh, what we see with Congresswoman Waters and Congresswoman Johnson is the committees that they are chair of are the committees that they were assigned to uh, when they were seat first seated in Congress. Aim for the committees with the most power. Always good because you can bring resources back from your district and they usually have subcommittees that will uh, uh, be most in line with your interest. And more black women would become committee chairs if the chairmanship uh, was rotated as the Republicans do, they rotate their chairmanships. And if you're given an opportunity to do that, you will see a rotation of chairs coming in and out and seniority will, be, um, will definitely play a factor and you will become a chair of committee at a quicker rate. So thank you so much for listening and I am happy to answer any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Um, at this time, I'm gonna talk about a few comments and then I will uh, open it up for questions right now. It's about 4.21. Uh, both of these papers uh, deal with political representation, particularly the particularly political representation uh, surrounding Black women in Congress. Uh, the I'll start with the Jackson uh, Strawbridge piece. I thought that this was a good paper. Uh, I appreciated the relevant research question as we deal with this pandemic, as we know that the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has revealed significant inequities of systemic racism within our society. And as a result, Blacks have become uh, disproportionately impacted in terms of deaths, infection rates, and so forth. Uh, that 
within the political climate that we're in with conversations about how do, do black politicians yield representation for black people, I think that this paper speaks to the idea or the notions that that black women bring a particular uh, perspective to legislative chambers, but then when they're compared to black men, sisters are standing up for black people in ways that black men aren't. And I think that this is confirmed um, in a number of the literature on gender and legislative politics. Uh, in particular, I think um, Valeria has a paper that talks about the influence of substance versus symbols, right? So we think about black representation within the context of there's a black who formally represents a group. And so what are the benefits of that? Uh, that's pushed a little bit further uh, with Catherine Tate's piece, uh, and with Claudine Gay's piece, um, Spirals of Trust, where she demonstrates that when there is a black, there's more like you're more likely to have interaction between them and their constituents. And so as we have conversations about whether or not the CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus is really, really representing the interests of black people, we see that this is one of the ways that they are doing it. We have black women, as your paper demonstrates, who are framing the COVID pandemic within a racialized lens. And I think things to consider, and, and I'm sure I've gone to these panels many times and people will say, do this, do that. And I'm sure as researchers, you probably said we went this way or whatever, but these are just some comments I would think about. Um, as Congress has becomes more diverse and you have now how black, some black women who are representing uh, districts that are racially mixed, right? What is the rhetoric that they're using to talk about the language? Because oftentimes, uh, Polit black politicians who are in districts that are represented by whites typically attempt to avoid racialized language in an effort to be to, to, to win elections. And so I wonder if uh, those individuals from district, those black members of Congress who are who are from districts that are racially mixed, are they speaking about these matters a little bit different? And I think that that can be difficult to parcel out given that you have a large size, a large, uh, well, a sample size, it would be difficult to parcel out, but I think zoning in on that. This paper also had me thinking about, you know, as, about the, the way in which we can pose questions and qualitative methods become a way of really, really zoning in on what we're trying to demonstrate empirically. So while you talk about you don't get significance with your regression models, you, you are able to look at it and make some conclusions, but then you're able to buffer that by saying, okay, and it, well, we couldn't show this this way, Here's the rhetoric in the language that we're using, and we're able to see these themes showing up in this particular way. Um, I would suggest, uh, very as a friendly uh, suggestion, perhaps consulting Nadia Brown's uh, uh, racial identity theory as a method of that guides it, that guides you guys as you sort of pick your cases. Uh, to demonstrate uh, that. I'm sure you're familiar with Nadia's work, she's your professors, or what have you. So that's an uh, interesting piece there. Um, the other question is, um, why does this matter? If Black women are, in fact, representing Black interests distinct from Black men, which I, which I think you're solid there, they do, really, really dig deep in terms of explaining to audiences why this matter? As we have, why does this matter? As we are, are having conversations about how do we uh, communicate uh, policy goals to individuals? Is policy the only form of representation, or does this representation come in the form of taking positions through rhetoric? Uh, and what are the ways in which that rhetoric uh, actually empowers Black communities to some extent to see someone speaking about these issues? So overall, I thought the paper was very good. These are just some of my general thoughts. Uh, moving on to the second piece, this particular paper deals with the role of committee chairmen, particularly uh, Black female committee chairmen in the U.S. Congress. And I think that this paper does a good job of sort of unpacking who these individuals are uh, at the national level. It's a small in size, but I also think you perhaps could extend this paper by looking at committee chairmen across time. Uh, other work to consider. Uh, Whitney Smooth, Kimberly Adams, and By and DeAndre has a piece on, I think this piece was published in 2007, uh, looking at committee chairmanships, and it's grappling with this idea of representation, right? Another thing I want to challenge you to think about is you correctly identify um, seniority and committee assignments and transfer, and I think that that is a major important piece of it, of, of seniority when it comes to committee chairmanships. 
But also there's the informal process that takes place behind closed doors. For example, if you piss Nancy Pelosi off, I don't care if you've been in Congress 20 years, she's not gonna give you a chairmanship. Uh, and so thinking about the ways in which uh, selection for committee chairmen, uh, as, as, as we think about women, takes place through an informal process. Uh, in terms of making behind behind the scenes uh, 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 deals with that. Another paper you may want to consider that can inform your work is a piece by Katrina Gamble written in 2007. And this piece talks about committee chairmen and legislative activity as well, but it looks at it, I think, from the local level. Um, and finally, I appreciate the focus on Black female, uh, Black women, uh, chairmen at the congressional level, because this is an area where we don't have a lot of research out, but there's a lot of theoretical work that you can ground your work in and really, really expand it, uh, it, it really, really expand uh, where you're going with this. I, uh, I also think, too, that as Congress becomes more diverse, these questions, we've got to answer these questions. What, is, what does it take to be a committee chairman? How do you get there? Uh, whether or not a committee, uh, I'm thinking of legislative leviathan by, uh, uh, I think, Keith, Keith Crable, uh, which talks about the strategic interaction of committee, of, of committee assignments and committee chairmanship. So if I'm serving on a particular committee or a chairman of a particular committee, how does that serve my re-election goals? And I think that these are critical questions that uh, can help to inform your piece. But I do think your most important contribution is the focus on Black female chairmen at the national level. And so we know through Catherine Tate's work, Black Faces in the Mirror, that Black women are that Black women are overrepresented in Congress. But we don't see that overrepresentation, perhaps, at, 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 as committee chairmen. What is that informal process? Also, another way of maybe gauging some of the questions that you're interested in with respect to this topic, maybe attempting to interview um, uh, committee chairmen, and that may be impossible, but I wonder if you could perhaps maybe focus at a state level or a different area to see what are the institutional barriers or challenges that these Black women face as they attempt to be represented on these committees. Because we oftentimes make the assumption that as Black politicians, we go into these, I'm not a black politician, but we make the assumption that black politicians go into these chambers and that they're able to change and transform institutions and committees. And they too, like every other black person, face institutional barriers, systemic racism, challenges as it relates to race and gender that may preclude them from being as effective or even getting a chairmanship. I think it was, um, uh, I can't, uh, Furge, uh, who was, uh, just confirmed in the Biden administration, who really challenged Nancy Pelosi in a public way when she was attempting to run for speaker, I think not this time, but the time before. And I often, she talked about the Democratic Party has a problem with racism in the caucus, something that you don't really see members of Congress talking about. So I think that that informal process also plays a role in who gets selected, whether or not you've been a good camper for the party, and so forth. So all in all, I think that these were excellent papers. Uh, Cody, I want to welcome you to Encoats. We hope that you come back. This is a, 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 a space to develop and to encourage. And we welcome all of you guys to be. We're happy that you're here. If you want to exchange information, uh, definitely this Encoats is where it is. And we appreciate all of you guys uh, for coming out to this panel. At this time, it is 4.30. We have uh, to to five o'clock and I can open the floor. Uh, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to respond to my comments if you want to, you don't necessarily have to. And at that time, I'll open it up to questions from the floor. Yeah, I, uh, I appreciate the comments. Uh, you said a lot of things that we've been thinking about kind of as we're building this into the larger paper now using the Twitter data, uh, the white composition one is one that we definitely uh, kept track of, even in, you know, because the coefficients weren't that important, but in our presentation, uh, like we found on that was, it was, you were slightly less likely to discuss uh, disparities, racial disparities, uh, when you were in a district that had a greater white composition. So that's something we're gonna be looking at more moving forward as all those variables are gonna matter more we have more data on that there. But I think 
to the question about um, why it matters, that's really what we're dealing with more of, we kind of saw this first paper with it for the editor volume is sort of like an exploratory, it was a smaller sample, kind of like, do we see the difference there? And now we really want to get into why it matters and have that conversation as we're going into this bigger project for it now. But we're definitely excited for that and answering that exact question because we think it does matter for a lot of reasons, but it's a matter of formulating it within, you know, the best, best way, but we're, we're working there, yeah. And, and you all do a good job. Don't don't think I'm saying you're not making the case as to why it matters. I was just say, I think that you can also connect it more to some of the practical things that we see happening. Oftentimes, we as academics talk to each other, and we understand these things very well. And I'll, you give it to a person on the street, they don't understand, or someone who's outside the academy. So I'm thinking of of, of just if you could walk through that just in a little more simplistic terms to really, really ground it in why it matters. It's definitely relevant. I think it's timely and it certainly matters for, for this question of, of how, our our, how representation takes place. I do wonder, are you guys familiar with ITAP? So there's a computer science program called ITAP. I'm actually using it for my book. We're trying to find the racist people on Twitter. And so you can actually search this particular, we're working with a computer scientist who's helping us write the program, but I can talk to you guys offline about that. And you can actually search through the, the globe with tweets from social media and it pulls things based off of themes. So that's just something to consider if you're looking uh, more so with tweets. All right. Yeah, and I think, I, I think that you do make a really good point, Emmett, as far as making it very like simplistic, like as far as the emphasis of like why this matters. Um, and I know in the <laughs> in the initial version of the paper, we were, we were kind of, in a, we were more so in a box. And, and in this box, it was individuals who don't really do what we do. They don't, they don't study black folks. They don't, don't think that any of this really matters. But now as we continue to move on to really make sure we are, you know, as I say, we drop in the breadcrumbs for the everyday reader of, hey, you know, black women are doing, like you said, doing, doing what they always do, showing up and showing out. And this does have real world implications in many ways as far as, you know, black women having these different barriers or having to do these different things in order to be able to get their power in order to be able to get support and 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 show constituents yeah i i do this i really do this so i i really appreciate that and i'm I, i've been making my notes so that's at the top of my list um and yeah we're gonna talk to dr brown we're gonna talk to dr brown i think we we kind of me and mj were talking about it we um in a roundabout way, maybe mention the racial ID theory um, without essentially naming it. And it might have just been because you know that focuses more on like the state legislature, but it might it might be good to point back to it to be able to kind of more to frame that section a little bit better. So I definitely agree with you on uh, definitely agree with you on that statement. So thank you again. Oh, thank you guys. You guys are doing excellent work. Uh, Cody, did you want to respond? And you can take a few minutes to respond if you want to, and then take about five, and then we're going to turn it over to questions. There's a couple of questions already in the chat, so take it away. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you all for welcoming me to this great conference, uh, most prestigious group. Uh, thank you very much for the recommendations that you gave me to extend the research. Um, and I have to agree with you, uh, Dr. Riley, that uh, the new secretary of HUD uh, did very so openly uh, challenge Speaker Pelosi uh, two years ago. And you may remember uh, so much so that the Congresswoman, then Congresswoman was named chair of a subcommittee to deal with elections. So people know that there is, uh, power and influence in chairing these committees. You know, when Congress began, uh, the speaker was so powerful, but now there is shared power and leadership with leadership and committee chairs. So yes, I look forward to extending this and having more conversations to make improvements. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, now we're gonna open it up to uh, for questions. It is around 4.36. Uh, there is a question in the chat, and if I overlook anybody's question, is 
honestly uh, by accident. So I'm trying to multitask by looking at the chat and do this. When I'm in class, I don't. I'm usually <laughs> focused on the screen. So this question is from uh, from Stephanie Williams. She says this is this question is for Cody. Have you considered how senior staffing and the ability for Black women to negotiate legislation and make deals impact their ability to become committee chair? I would also look at how their ability to campaign and support other members on the committee as they aspire to impact their rise. Seniority is important, but often committee chairs have to show their political skill too, skills too, in addition to policymaking skills. Yeah. You're on mute. You know, I've heard that so much in the last year, it would seem like I would take myself off mute. So definitely. Uh, the ability to campaign and support support their colleagues play uh, a role in becoming a committee chair because what we know is that Black Congresswomen struggle, um, I shouldn't say struggle, but they are not on par to raising the same amount of money uh, as their white counterparts and that influences things. If you have a white colleague who can give you $20,000 towards your reelection campaign, you have a black congresswoman colleague who could give you a thousand dollars and then they're both in a race with one another you're probably going to support the one who gave a little bit more to your campaign as far as the senior level staffing yes uh, that plays a role in congress because there is a um, high staff turnover uh, in congress because they are not making the salaries that they would make in private sector so what you see is a lot of individuals who staff and um, help members of Congress strategize are not there um, for long periods of time to see them transition into leadership. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Go I was going to say, Cody, um, we have a colleague, Guillermo Caballera, he uh, works on women in the state legislatures and his dissertation is actually on power. And he's essentially like reconceptualizing power and specifically talking about how power looks different for black women mm -hmm. in the state in state legislatures. Um, so when he does deposit, he, he should be depositing his dissertation this summer. I would definitely check out that piece because he's really talking about the different ways uh, that black women have to maneuver mm -hmm. and, and, and essentially like through the informal and the formal processes to be able to get what they need done. And so I wonder if that could be useful for you in regards to figuring out, you know, these different recommendations for how black women may be able to strategize to be able to, you know, kind of showcase, hey, we should be getting these, these uh, chair positions and we're not. Or like, how do we go about that? And how do we put, bring that to the forefront? So I thought that would be like useful to you. Thank you. Uh, can you just make sure that I have the correct spelling of his name? That yes. would really help. Uh, something that I, uh, I thank you again for making the connection because something that I saw is that there, you know, may be a possibility that Black Congresswomen who serve in state legislative seats before coming to Congress are more prepared to uh, yeah. wield right. political power because right. they've been trained to do it. Right, and and he he has some very he does. Um, He's an interpretivist and he has some very, very good, like great gems in his interviews of how these women are, are, are navigating, like I said, the formal and the informal process. This is the hoops that they are jumping through to get things done for their constituents mm -hmm. is absolutely shocking. So I, like I said, I wonder if that, like you say, is that a mirror to how then you would perform at the, uh, when you got into Congress, if you had been in the state legislature. So. Thank you again. And just as you guys were talking, some other, uh, and, if, and if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. We still have time. But as you guys were talking, I was thinking about uh, Nadia's book, Sisters in the State House, and also connecting that back to uh, Heel Styles, Home Styles, Heel Styles. And we know a lot about, or at least we, to some degree, we know a lot about what the public believes about Congress. But we don't ever get the experience of women who serve in these positions. And so, for example, what we do know is that Black women are over-sexualized, Black women are often described as confrontational, and white people have problems taking directions from strong Black women. Having said that, we know that Congress is not a diverse institution in terms of the number of whites relative to their relative outnumbering Blacks. It would be interesting to see what is the experience 
of these women committee chairmen with dealing with these majority male caucuses and the way in which that shows up and how they function. You know, on one hand, it is the policy piece, which is important. But on the other hand, you know, I'm thinking about um, Julia Zachary Jordan's paper on storytelling. What is the experience of these women as it relates to uh, being on, the, on, on these different committees? How do they see their gender functioning? Uh, in terms of uh, serving in, in these leadership roles. I uh, wrote a piece and I've been sort of drug into the women literature on this. I wrote a piece about black mayors in Mississippi where I interviewed the first black mayor of Greenwood and the first black mayor of um, Greenville. And one of the things I wanted to know is how did they represent black interests? What challenges did they face as politicians, as campaigns? And I also wanted to know how did they see their race and gender influencing their ability to govern. And the things that you get revealed in how women are told to shut up when they're trying to talk on in a committee meeting or how they're over talk. And I think that these are real experiences that it, for the most part, political science scholarship haven't taken that serious in terms of it being mainstream. So it's def you guys, both of you guys, uh, both of you all definitely have some great work you're doing and, and work that I think is going is meaningful and will certainly make a contribution to to black politics for sure. Um, someone uh, put in the group, can they ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, you see, I'm sorry, you said you had your hand raised and I didn't see it because I've been looking at the screen. So yes, you can ask a question. Now I'm not sure if your camera's gonna come on. So can you prop just type your question in the public chat and then it's we'll it's it's me. Michael, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I want to ask a question. Go on. I don't know if this is a webinar or, or a chat. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I enjoyed the presentations. Um, thanks so much. I had a, a, a just a question for each uh, panelist, if you could just give me some feedback. So on the Brown Strawbridge and Jackson paper, uh, I like the fact that you were using the, the C-SPAN archives to really Kind of look at these deliberations and seeing the differences between the members and so and, and as you guys said i don't think you found it too surprising right that that black women and black men basically advocated looking at COVID and looking at the disparities um the racial disparities in terms of the response now i i was curious do you think that there's a a difference in terms of preparedness like do they is, is there a difference because most of the most of what we see is like the the issue in terms of response in terms of who's being most affected and are blacks getting access to treatment but I, I wonder about preparedness in terms of health care and like even pandemic response so but, but anyway I don't know if you're that far along on, on, in that particular area but um I was the, the issue about black men and black women in terms of the deliberations that you didn't see much of a difference in terms of race and you were saying that you think it might because of the salience. Um, I wonder, it, I mean, excuse me, because because of the size, but I wonder how much of it has to do with the salience of the issue too. And then also, why would you theoretically expect black men and black women to uh, behave differently. So I, I, I think it's probably in your paper, but in the presentation, it wasn't really clear to me why there is this expectation that black men and black women would, would approach it differently in terms of their deliberations. Um, um, and then also, do you think that because you were looking at Congress, do you think there might be some variance in terms of if you look at a lower level like state or local level, um, would you be likely to find more differences and rather at a national level in turn. Because most of the action on COVID um, is happening kind of like at the state and local level. So I wonder if you would see any, any differences there. Um, and then um, uh, you guys probably already know about this book by Ryango, Beth Ryango, Carrie Haney, um, Kristen Widener, uh, race, gender, and political representation. So they kind of look at these issues of intersection at the state level. So. Um, Anyway, so that's that's one recommendation, and I'm sure you probably already did. Um, for the uh, for for Cody the, the Dorsey paper, um, I, I like the focus on committee chair. You know, first of all, I like all this when you're talking about hearings and you're talking about the kind of insider stuff in terms of the committee chairs. Um, 
have you had a chance to look at this in terms, because most of what you were talking about was the full committees, right? Um, in terms of, of women. And have you had a chance to look at it at the subcommittee level to see if there's any type of parity there where you see more black women uh, serving on the subcommittee level? Um, and then also I was just wondering, are you kind of making a policy recommendation that seniority kind of be put aside and allow for more rotation of the full committee chairs in order to allow for more opportunity for, for black women to, to take the reins? Um, I, I know the CDC is against it, but I, I, I'm curious if black women within the caucus um, uh, thinks differently. So, thank you. Sure, I'll go. I can go first. Uh, no, I am not recommending that <laughs> you know seniority be put aside. What I'm recommending is that maybe there is term limits for committee chairmanship. So, if Congresswoman Waters is there for two terms or three terms, maybe she cycles out, and another more senior member become chair of the committee. Because eventually, you'll see more black members becoming committee chairs um, at a quicker rate. Uh, uh, and I have looked at it very uh, much more brief than full committees at the subcommittee level. Black congresswomen do become um, subcommittee chairs. Um, it is less based on seniority at the subcommittee level. Yeah, I think just to answer one, uh, the one I remembered the most from them all, all the questions about kind of why we expect the difference between black men and black women. Uh, I think it came more from the perspective of, and I'm like the outsider of the three of us on the project, the most like away from the gender stuff. But even I noticed the fact that like, we discussed kind of racial differences among member of Congress and that the black members of this collective are gonna be the ones then to discuss issues a certain way, or then, you know, there's gender differences of women in Congress uh, are acting different than men. But then it's the importance of thinking about the fact we're looking at race and gender together and how that's an important distinction. And it was more a question of one being under a professor that is obviously an expert in black women, but then also the importance of just thinking about race and gender together and how those are both two important kind of distinctions. And for black women, their, their uh, experience both at the same time, how that's going to affect the way that they represent. And to the preparedness question, yeah, I. When we looked at the quality of the stuff and the answer they were giving, anecdotally, I would say that yes, uh, I think they'd be more prepared just from the way they were able to discuss certain issues and just so readily describe just uh, plights of random uh, citizens. Uh, that was intriguing for us on the qualitative side. So, but I do think that'd be more of a state level thing. You see even more preparedness and kind of differences there just because of the level of who's doing the work on that versus, you know, Congress isn't in the same way as state, le state legislators are. One other area too, and I'm sure you guys know this, is much of what we know from the literature that black women are more ambitious than black men. Black women are more ambitious than white women. They're more likely to challenge for leadership positions, more likely to seek out advancement in the party. And that, and, and so I guess the, my question is the why, what explains this in this era of high racial tension, right? So if, if we're dealing with areas of systemic racism, what is accounting for this difference? And, and, and I haven't, at least I'm not, I haven't gotten to the why in terms of uncovering. I've seen explanations for it, but this has been a consistent theme. I've seen studies find since I've been, well, I've said since I've been doing this and that's just been since 2014 when I graduated from graduate school, but it's been central to a lot of the work I've done on representation that black women they just show up and show out more than the brothers. <laughs> and I think that's too indicative of just society at large, that Black women have been the glue that have held together Black communities. And we just see this now happening uh, through policymaking. Um, and, you know, what, what did Monique tell Charlemagne? We got to explain brothers like you. So we, <laughs> we got we to gotta explain some of us. <laughs> right. And so, yeah, and I was thinking, I, I was thinking more so expecting this difference, the difference of approach or a approach to discussing the topic in regards to thinking back to what we know about Black women lawmakers and the things that they prioritize. And, you know, I mean, Black, uh, Black politicians and women politicians have both been given their area of stereotypical 
uh, issue positions. But for Black women, it's more of this mixing pot. It's this, the things that matter, you know, it's education, it's healthcare. And think about it like this, these are all things that have been affected by the coronavirus pandemic, where so of you may see um, Black male politicians focusing on more other, or other areas, like some of the racialized areas and the economy, we see black women like, uh-uh, uh-uh, the hospitals are breaking down, the schools, the babies aren't, aren't getting fed at school and all of these things that they've already been thinking about, but now are being exacerbated. So it's like, no, 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 no. Like, yes, that's important, but we have to make sure we don't forget about these things. And in regards to preparedness, at first I didn't know what you meant by preparedness, but hearing MJ, um, like, for, and I'm, I'm guessing that you were saying preparedness to speak about the topic or preparedness in regards to your remarks as far as how you want to talk about uh, these different disparities. Black women don't have a choice but to be prepared. Uh, there is no faking it until you make it. Most of the time, people don't want to hear what you have to say. So if you do not come with, if you come half stepping, it's not going to be, it's, it's not going to be well received. So I do think that there may be a difference in preparedness. I don't know how you would exactly try and measure that or try to parse that out per se, because when you think, when you think about it as regards of like who has been in the political game longer, at least on this level, you would think that Black men will come prepared. But like I said, I'm not, I'm not sure how you would measure that. And, but I, I, that's something to think about. Now, as far as differences in the state and local level, I think we would, I'm, I'm, I'm from the South, so I would definitely love to see how that would parse out in places like Mississippi, Georgia, Tennessee. I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, um, and everywhere I've lived seems like it's been a political shit show. So I, I really, I, <laughs> I'm gonna have to make a note to tell MJ and Dr. Brown that we should try and to look into this because I wonder, um, especially knowing what I know about our colleagues research as far as power. I wonder what extra hoops these these women are having to go through in order to be able to advocate and be able to talk about the coronavirus pandemic in a way that is well received when half of the members in the legislative chamber don't believe the coronavirus is real and won't wear a mask and proceed to be in your space and not give you six feet. So I think that is a very good suggestion. Um, I think that's a very good suggestion. So thank you for that. In terms of measuring it, uh, you probably could create a candidate quality index. I actually did this uh, in a study I did uh, with a book chapter that's published actually, where I looked at the politician and I had to research each individual one. And, I, and the, it's, a, it's a metric where they're assigned a point if they've had previous experience at state level government, another point if it's local government, another point if it was appointed position. And so that particular, I forget the scholar who coins this particular method, but it's borrowed from someone else. And it's actually an old person, somebody from probably like the 80s. Um, and it's called a, a candidate quality index. And you can code them for quality. But one of the things we, and I used it to see what were the quality of the candidates that were challenging sitting incumbents in Congress. And what we found is that, of course, it's a lower quality candidate. So that may be one way to parcel or at least to get at that or gauge that. But also too, thinking about committees, committees also serve as information distributing, distributing entities. So there's the theoretical work which suggests that we members of Congress self-select their committees and that they serve on committees as a way to distribute information for experts. So if I'm an education expert and education is a big part of my campaign, I may want to be on education. And so I'm an expert in that particular area. That's that's some other theoretical work that's out too about how they get on these committees. All right. I, they want to say one thing. Uh, I forget you mentioned the part about uh, salience. We did control, we ran the models again, controlling for if it was a hearing that was discussing disparities, because uh, there are a number of hearings that were on kind of the essential workers or hearings that were on kind of our racial disparities. So we did control for that. We control for that. We did see the, the differences where it then just slightly greater. It wasn't enough to really make a big deal of it. Well, controlling for the sale of the topic of, you know, kind of prompting you to now dis uh, discuss the disparities for general racial and black racial disparities. Uh, the results are about the same then. All right, are there any other questions? We have about less than five minutes. It's 4.56 as we speak. 
So are there any other concluding comments as we uh, wrap up? I just want to again continue to uplift and encourage our graduate students uh, and welcome you guys into this space. Continue to do uh, good work, continue to seek out networks and continue to bear testament in all of your scholarship and service to our people. If there is nothing else for the good, well, we have another question, hold on. All these workers, okay, someone is just congratulating you guys in the chat. So if there's nothing else, we can chat for a few minutes and people can disperse, but I do, I appreciate all of these papers, absolutely. Someone says, do you have book recommendations for you from your research? Is this for me or to the panelists? Um, do you have uh, book recommendations from your research? Um, I mean, so I have a lot of books. Or, I mean, I, I, so uh, Congress for Black, for Congress in, in Black and White by Christian Gross, I think is a good piece that began. Uh, Sisters in the State House by Nadia Brown has become influential for some of the work that I have done. Um, much of what I do deals with racial resentment. Oh, this was to the panel, it's not for me, this was to the panel. And this question is, do you have book recommendations to the panelists? Anything interesting that you ran across in working on this paper? That's the question in the panel. Yeah, so there's a piece by Dr. Brown and Sarah Gershon that's about political communication, differences in political communication. Um, and it looks at the, uh, the confirmation of Brent Kavanaugh. And that was a, a very interesting piece and just to see the, the different methods that they used. And um, I think not from this particular project, but anyone is thinking about doing like women in politics, black women in politics, distinct identities, uh, which is an edited volume by Dr. Brown and Dr. Gershon has become a go-to of mine. It's like a book that I borrowed that I probably will never give back. So I would <laughs> recommend that um, as well. Um, MJ, do you have any other, do you have any other recommendations? I mean, uh, the, the one we cited, uh, Tillery's piece, that, uh, that, that piece from him, I, I'm pulling up the name of it now, but I think that kind of is what sparked a lot of our questions about the Black men and Black women representation. Uh, what was it titled? Uh, yeah, uh, Tweeting Racial Representation, How Congressional Black yeah. Caucus Used Twitter yeah. in the 1 to 13th Congress. Uh, like the discussion in that piece is what really set the stage for us along with what we described already. Uh, but then also kind of, if you're trying to get an idea of where we're heading with this, now looking at trying to pull COVID related tweets, man, pandemic related discussions on Twitter, we're modeling a lot of it after kind of like what that laid the foundation for of us there, as far as thinking about kind of racial rhetoric and differences between black men and black women. And, and then I think taking a further step back to like the, like the canonical work. I, I know I love Homestyle. I know we didn't talk about it in this one, but I love Homestyle. I don't know why I love that book so much. It's those centric circles. <laughs> yeah, it was, I, was like, I, was like, I was like, I love Homestyle. So I would say Homestyle by Richard Fennell, especially when, you know, he gets in there, he's talking to these folks and, and he gets all in their business. So I, I, I'm big uh -huh. on what Emmett was saying as far as the, the storytelling piece. I think that half of the battle, what we miss is by not taking the chance to account for people experiences and that was really how we're gonna get a full encompassing picture of, of politics for black folks we're gonna have to talk to them and sit with them and all this other stuff that we don't think is even significant but politics for us is an everyday thing it is something that we carry with us on our backs wherever we go so i would recommend for now. Oh, absolutely. I, I absolutely I echo all of that. Because I, I also think, too, I have another panel uh, in about 15 minutes, but I got a little time, as, as uh, Moneybag Yo said, we got time today. Um, we miss so much by trying to quantify everything. And oftentimes, when we try to quantify things that we, we, we don't capture those narratives, I, one of the first pieces I did was transcribing these interviews and really listening like, wow, you would be surprised at how, or at least I was surprised at how when black women discuss the representation of black interests, that is not in isolation. 
that they're connecting the school to healthcare. They're connecting healthcare to what's happening in the environment. They're connecting what's happening in the environment to what the infrastructure looks like. And it becomes a multi-layered tier of really, really advocating for policies, but it's confounded with the reality is that they are Black women who face challenges. And that as they attempt to, to, to yield these challenges, they too, you know, are often demonized and often described in, in ways that are that are that are, are, are disparaging. So I think that this is great work. I look forward to seeing it hopefully in the National Review of Black Politics soon uh, or some journal. And guys, keep up the great work. Uh, Jasmine, keep putting on for the sip now. All right. Uh, this is all I have, people. You guys be blessed if you need me. Uh, my email, I put my email in the chat if I can assist you guys in any way. Uh, I'm most happy to do so. Thank you. <laughs>